Check, check, check. All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Ooh, we can do better. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm the Senior Associate Pastor here at First United Methodist Church in Fort Worth. Welcome to The Gathering. The Gathering is two services of worship and connection, service and communion here at the church at 9.30 and 11 o'clock. Uh, at 9.30, we actually worship in two locations, right here in Wesley Hall on the first floor and also on the third floor in the Gathering, Gathering Cafe. This is the first time we have that worship space open. Uh, we use that space to kind of spread out a little bit to make some more seats available here at 9.30 for first-time guests and visitors. To all of you who are worshiping in the Gathering Cafe this morning, Thank you so much for making space. You are just as much a part of the service. Uh, Everything that happens here happens up there. There's more food options. There'll be communion up there. Uh, When you're singing along in the Gathering Cafe, what you'll have is some lyric sheets available to you. They're upstairs. If you don't have one with you already, make sure to grab a lyric sheet. That way you have the lyrics for all the songs that we're singing together. A couple quick words of announcement before we get going here today. Uh, One, I want to let you know that we do something every month called the Christian Men's Breakfast this time of year. I lead that group. That group is folks in their 30s, 40s, or 20s, 30s, and 40s, guys who are balancing life and faith and family and career all at the same time. What we do is we get together over at Whiskey Ranch, which is the home of Firestone Robertson Distilling on the east side of Fort Worth. They have an amazing event space. I buy breakfast and coffee for everybody. We get together for an hour. Uh, We have a lesson. We have a conversation. It's a great chance for you to meet other guys who are going through the same phase of life. Uh, You'll really be strengthened by it. I love it every month. The next one's coming up this Wednesday on the attendance cards that are in your seat. Uh, You can indicate your interest by checking on that box, the Christian Men's Breakfast, and I'll include you in all the emails that go on about that. So uh, it's a really important time of year, guys. One of the best things you can do for yourself is invest in your own faith uh, and your own relationship with God. I hope that you take part of that this Wednesday. Next announcement, uh, we have Christmas Eve this year. We've decided to do it on, on December 24th. Uh, I want to invite you to come and worship with us even more so. What I would like you to do is to consider being one of the people who helps make Christmas Eve special for those who are attending worship, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time. We have a huge need for ushers and volunteers. These are the frontline greeters, the people who extend the hospitality of Christ all the way out into the parking lot during all of our worship services. We're going to worship together at noon, 3, 5, Five, seven, nine, and 11 on Christmas Eve. Uh, we need volunteers and ushers for all of those services. There's going to be sign-up sheets in the back of both places, both Wesley Hall and the Gathering Cafe today. Uh, so if y'all would consider signing up for that, it's an awesome way for your family to serve together uh, and to really make Christmas special. So please consider doing that. Uh, next announcement. We have an incredibly important moment in the life of our church coming up next Sunday. Uh, At 12.30 in the sanctuary, we're going to be having a vote to move forward with the capital campaign for the uh, possible building expansion to help our church continue to meet its mission needs. Uh, That vote's going to be at 12.30. It's going to be a short meeting, uh, and it's an opportunity. It's not a commitment to build the building. It's not a commitment to take on debt. It's just an authorization to move forward. It's a requirement in the Book of Discipline that the all-church vote take place. Uh, Whoever is able to participate in the all-church vote are people who are members of the church and people who are in attendance. So uh, we need you to be physically in attendance next Sunday, 1230 in the sanctuary. Uh, This isn't a done deal yet, right? Regardless of how you feel about this vision, it's important that you come and cast your vote. So please, 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 please be present next Sunday, 1230 in the sanctuary uh, to cast a vote in this all church vote um, for possible building expansion. Please come next Sunday. And then finally, One of the things, uh, or that's it, that's all my announcements. Um, So what we're going to do is we're going to pass the baskets. Uh, Two things go in the baskets every time we come together. The first is our uh, attendance cards. Uh, Whether this is your first time in the gathering or your 100th time in the gathering, you're here every Sunday. Please make note of your attendance here today. Uh, On the back of the card, you can indicate interest in things like uh, the young professionals group and the the singles in their 20s and 30s who come uh, and hang out at church together. There's uh, the Christian men's breakfast. Opportunities to have a cup of coffee with me. If you'd indicate your interest in that as the basket comes around, we'd love to follow up with you. The second thing that goes in our baskets are our tithes and our offerings. These are our financial gifts, the support that make all the ministries of the church possible. And typically, the church receives about 30% of its annual budget in the month of December. So if you're one of those people who now is the time where you give and really support the ministries of the church going forward, uh, please recognize this has been an incredible year of ministry. Growth in attendance, growth in affirmations of faith, growth in worship, growth in discipleship, all age groups, all experiences. This church is thriving. 2019 is going to be an amazing year for us. 
us as a congregation, and that's all possible with your faithful giving and support. We need each and every person to participate in this mission work. So uh, thank you very much for your faithful tithing and offering uh, to support the ministries of this church. I'm now going to ask you to stand and join me in the invocation. Uh, Standard church rules apply. I'm going to read the leader portion. We are all going to read out loud the bold in italics. Please join with me. The days are shorter and darkness comes early to our lives. Lord, hear our prayers through the darkness. Come, seek the Lord. Place your hope in God's mercy and love. Lord, we seek your presence among us. Look closely. God is making us ready. Brighten our spirits this day and help us to receive your good news. Amen. Good morning. Good morning here at the gathering and good morning to the gathering cafe that's worshiping with us upstairs and all those who are worshiping online with us. My name is Savannah and I'm so excited to be in this season of Advent together with you and uh, to worship together. Um, We have a fun song starting out with y'all, Go Tell It on the Mountain, and we may ask y'all to participate with us, so get ready for that. Hope you're you're awake. (laughs) If not, let's... Let's get ready for it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. You may all be seated. If it wasn't enough change to introduce a second worshiping venue of the gathering at 930, if it wasn't enough change to introduce the, uh, the new breakfast tacos and the breakfast items that we're selling in the kitchen when we, in between services on a Sunday, we're also going to add a second song in our worship between the prayers of the people and the sermon. So our band's going to stay up there and wait, but this time of the service, what we always do is pray together as a church. We speak to God together knowing that God listens to us. We listen to God together knowing that God speaks. We do this through prayers of the people. I'm going to start out with a prayer of confession. Prayers of confession are just about honestly acknowledging where God is reaching each and every one of us today. God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we'll pray to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. After all of these things, uh, I am going to say, Lord, in your mercy, and you're going to respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. 
I'm going to say a few names, and then I'm going to say, are there any others? And when I say, are there any others, it's your chance to pray out loud, to say the names of people uh, in your lives, people you're aware of that have good news that we want to celebrate and give thanks to God for. It's also a chance to say out loud the names of people who are struggling, the names of people who are suffering, the names of people who might be experiencing grief or loss, hopelessness, addiction, depression, who knows? It's a chance for us to say out loud the name of God's people, knowing that always and everywhere, God hears our prayers. Together, as a church, let us pray. It's so easy for us, Lord, to let the anger, frustration, and fear overshadow our lives. We can't seem to escape it. We try to find some way to cover it up, but it remains. And in our anxiety, we act out our fear in ways which are not helpful and far too often go against the ways you have taught us to live. We feel the pressure to give and resentment in giving. We feel the push to be present at every upcoming event, and we want to run and hide. Help us, Lord. Heal our wounded spirits. Free us again to look to you for hope. Let us see the many ways in which you are present to us, guiding, healing, loving, encouraging. Forgive us for our fears and our stubbornness. Bring us again to your light, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, our prayers. prayers. Father God, you are the creator of all things, everything. And everything that you create, you proclaim to be good. And evidence of that goodness continues to testify to you all around us, even today. New hope, new lives, new opportunities. For all of this, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. At the same time, O oh God, everything that you create, you make to be free. And over and over again, that freedom is used for purposes of sin, for violence, for hatred, for greed, for anger. Remind us, O oh God, that when we were at our worst, you did not give up on us or turn away from us. But instead, on that Christmas morning long ago, you joined us, came alongside us in the power and presence of your Son, Jesus the Christ, not to forsake us, but through his life, death, and resurrection to redeem us and reconcile us back to you forever. For this good news, O God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we are never alone. But through the power of your Holy Spirit, you guide us, complete us, walk alongside us, shine a light before us on our path, make it possible for us to experience your loving grace. For this constant presence, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Nathan, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Bill, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Pat, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For all the names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, O oh God, hear our prayers. For all of the people looking for strength to face another uncertain or difficult day, hear our prayers. For all the people seeking to change their life, to experience your forgiveness, grace, and healing for the first time ever, hear our prayers. And for each and every one of us, seeking to know your will and to be your people in the world, hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, continue to make us in the image of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You can remain seated for the song. But feel free to sing along with us.
Thank you so much for the band, for all of your faithful leadership and service and in rehearsing all during the week. Thank you to all our volunteers who've set up not only in 930 in the Wesley Hall, but also upstairs in the Gathering Cafe. Everyone in the cafe, I know volume can kind of go up and down. If you ever need to raise the volume, there's a little control panel in the back. Carmen knows how to do it. Hey, Karma. Uh, so glad you're all here with us today. Uh, it's Christmas, y'all. It's Christmas. We made it. We withheld until after Thanksgiving. We resisted. And if you didn't, bless your heart. You do you, right? I'm so thankful that we're here in this time. Uh, we just moved into a new neighborhood, and apparently our neighborhood has a tradition where you, someone ding-dong ditches you, but leaves a stocking, and then you have like 24 hours to fill the stocking and ding-dong ditch somebody else. I don't know. That's on my to-do list now. I hope that all of you are experiencing wonderful surprises in your life everywhere we go. Uh, of course, Christmas and, and life in the church is all intertwined and all mixed up. And of course, how we think about it is so incredibly important. And I'm going to talk a lot about how we think about Christmas, of course, over the course of this month, because how we think about Christmas, how we observe Christmas, what we have going on in our hearts during this time has a huge impact on our lives, not just during this portion of the year, but the entire year. And I have to be honest, there's a way to kind of do it wrong, right? Or the ways, there's a way to do it not so great. And a cautionary tale for that is me, right? A cautionary tale for that is experiences I've had in my own life. So uh, I grew up, you know, close by. I also grew up in Tarrant County, and I had a family that, of course, observed Christmas, and we weren't super involved and plugged in in the church, so we had more of that cultural Christmas thing going on. But it was really pretty, and it was really nice, and we had family over, and we had, there were the parties, and there was the decorations, and there were the big meals, and there were all those things. But I had to be honest, you know, I was a, a kid, right? I was you know, a little kid or a teenager, and you can say a holiday is about family and about friends and about decorations and about get-togethers and all that kind of stuff, but y'all, at the end of the day, there was a Nintendo in it, Right? <laughs> And so you can say a day is about whatever you want, but if at the end of the day there's a Nintendo, that day is about Nintendo, 
right? Like that's what really resonated in my heart and in my life. And so even though I knew all the right things to say and I knew what we're doing and I'm a teenager and I'm a college kid even and I know what it's about, at the end of the day, right, I've got a Santa-shaped Jesus and this is all I'm really looking for uh, is, is my wish list, right? It's all coming down to what happens on Christmas morning. And even though people were saying all the right things, like even though people were saying around me all the things about it's about family and about love and about all this kind of stuff, at the end of the day, right, it was about the biggest gift I got all year, which is truly when it happened. And so what happened after that was that, that kind of grew old and it kind of grew stale and it grew unfulfilling in the way that it does in so many of our lives. Materialism does not generate grace and peace and hope and joy in anyone's life. And so even in my early 20s, I, I started to feel that really becoming empty. And so I really kind of realized how crass and materialistic my own Christmas heart was. And so I tried to step away from it, but there wasn't really anything in its place, right? It was just, you know, some get-togethers and some garland and, uh, you know, getting around with the family at the hearth and watching Die Hard, the world's greatest Christmas movie, <laughs> right? That's all it was. And so I was wanting to figure out, you know, something more. And I remember specifically, uh, almost 10 years ago, I was having this, this desire in my heart to really have something more special go on, right? To really have a Christmas that was more deeply connected to what God was doing in the world and me. And so I prayed about it. I prayed about it, and I just kind of had this prayer, right? Like, literally, like, God, this obviously means more to everyone else than it does to me. And I was praying, and I was praying, and I was praying, and I had a pretty good Christmas season, you know, and the result of all those prayers, I felt more in the spirit, and I felt more uh, kind of happy and fulfilled, and, and good things were going on in my life. But uh, Christmas morning, the actual, or not Christmas evening, the actual day of Christmas, I had a chance to actually be a part of a miracle. I had a chance to participate in a miracle, and it changed everything about my understanding of Christmas and a lot of things about my life. So that's what we're going to be talking about over the course of today. So the sermon series that we're doing is uh, called Christmas is Not Your Birthday, right? Christmas is not your birthday. And it's one of those things where when you have a sweater like this, and then on Saturday you're walking around your house and you're going like, no, wait, I can actually wear that <laughs> to church. Y'all, this is not a sweater. This is my, my liturgical vestments for today. <laughs> These are my vestments. It's very, it's very traditional. A lot of people are familiar with the, the Happy Birthday Boy sweater. Um, Christmas is not your birthday, and what I want to point out is that the way that our world tells us to celebrate Christmas is to celebrate it as a birthday, right? Particularly as your birthday, right? Think of what your birthday usually has. I'll tell you what my birthday usually has. It usually has uh, a bunch of parties and get-togethers, right? My birthday usually has really good food uh, and really good drinks and people that I don't spend a whole lot of time with coming together. Uh, we decorate the house for my birthday, right? And then my birthday culminates with presents for me, right? And 25 Hallmark movies made in, in celebration of my birthday. That's what it's like every year. No? Okay? Not funny? The cafe is laughing, um, right? So like that's what my birthday is like. And typically what we try to do is celebrate Christmas like it's our birthday, right? Like it's our birthday. And so one of the things you're not going to hear over the course of this sermon series, you're not going to be hearing me talking down to anybody. You're not going to hear a whole bunch of uh, you know, y'all, you know, stop doing X, stop doing Y, stop doing Z. I'm not going to tell you to do all these kind of things. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you into something more. All right, I'm going to invite you into something a little bit more meaningful, I think. I'm going to invite you into something a lot more powerful. Uh, I'm going to invite you to participate and to think, maybe to talk to your kids, maybe to talk to your family members, maybe to talk to the people in your life, your spouses, significant others, anyone. I'm going to invite you into some ways of being that might make Christmas a little bit more meaningful in your life and a lot more like what God is doing during this season. Right? And that spirit of invitation is really important to think about. Right? There's a lot of theology talking about invitation because that is, what ex that is exactly what God is doing in Jesus. Right? The entire Jesus story, right? the entire story of Jesus' life and all of his teachings, his workings, his miracles, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ongoing testimony and work through the church is all about God inviting us, right? God presenting a better way to us, God trying to include us in what God is doing, right? showing us how much better it is, showing us how much richer it is, showing us how much more true it is to what God created everything to be than what we've let ourselves settle for, right? So that's what we're going to be doing over the course of this entire talk, is inviting you into letting Christmas be something so much more than just your birthday, and instead letting Christmas be something that has a lot more to do with what God is doing in the world through Jesus. So that's what we're going to be doing. 
I have a little uh, slide we're going to be going through every week. I'm going to be giving you some particular things uh, that I want you to do to help, get in, to help you uh, follow this. This is something you can actually be talking to your kids about, right? Something you can actually be uh, bringing up in conversation, reflecting on in your own life. And we've got one for this week, right? Uh, that's where that line comes up. This is what I need you to do. If you're going to start looking at Christmas as Jesus' birthday, right, and that doesn't just mean like a one-day event, right, just the culmination on the calendar, that if we're going to actually kind of live into this season as drawing us closer into what God is doing in Jesus, and the first thing it's going to involve us is us looking for miracles, right, looking for miracles. And it's weird to think about miracles uh, as being something you need to look for, Right? I mean, typically, our understanding uh, of a miracle is something that just drops out of the sky and lands on uh, our heads. A miracle is something that just um, you know, bursts out of the creation that can't possibly be ignored, that can't possibly be overlooked. But we see over and over again in the Bible and in the lives of the church that miracles are usually something you actually have to be on the lookout for. And our text today is going to help us understand that. I want to, text to, I want to turn to uh, the Gospel of Luke. There's uh, four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Luke is the third. We're going to be in chapter four. A whole bunch of our Christmas narrative comes from the Gospel of Luke. Um, pretty much everything about the Christmas story that's covered in the Charlie Brown Christmas, that's all Luke's version of the Christmas story, but we're actually not in the Christmas story today. Uh, what I want to share from you today is a story that happens very early on in Jesus' ministry. But this is after he's a grown man. This is after he's gone out and experienced the temptation. This is actually when he's starting to preach and to teach uh, and to tell people who he is, and more importantly, what God is doing in the world through him. Right? This is one of the earliest stories. Now, there's been a miracle that's already happened uh, so far in this story, but yet Jesus has now gone somewhere very unusual. Jesus has gone somewhere very bold. Jesus has gone back to his hometown, right? Jesus is going back to his hometown. The people that know him, right? The people that have known him since he was a little boy, the people that know his mama and the people that know his daddy and the people that don't have a gospel story being told to them over and over again about who he is and where he's from, right? All they understand him to be is the likely illegitimate child of Mary and Joseph, right, located in their little backwater, nowhere town in the middle of uh, the chosen land, right? And so this is who they understand Jesus to be. And he walks up to their synagogue, right? He walks to the central place of their worship and their connection, and he begins to speak to them, these people who know him and who have seen him grow up. And this is what he says. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4. We're going to read uh, verses 14 through 30. At the end, I'm going to say God speaks to us through the reading of scripture, and you're going to say out loud, thanks be to God. Hear these words. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So he's traveling all around the world, he's traveling all around the area, and everyone else who sees him is praising him, is being thankful for him. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, and then he reads from the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He finished, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. Everyone was raving about Jesus, so impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? Then Jesus said to them, undoubtedly you will quote this, saying to me, doctor, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we've heard you did in Capernaum. That is, do all the miracle stuff that you've been doing everywhere else. Do it right here for us. He said, I assure you that no prophet is welcome in the prophet's hometown. And I can assure you that there were many widows in Israel during Elijah's time when it didn't rain for three and a half years and there was a great food shortage in the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but to only a widow in the city of Zarephath in the region of Sidon, meaning not to the people that he was from, but to distant people, other people, the rest of the world. There were also many persons with skin diseases in Israel during the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them were cleansed. Instead, Naaman the Syrian was cleansed someone else from somewhere else. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was filled with anger. 
They rose up and ran him out of town. They led him to the crest of the hill on which their town had been built so that they could throw him and went on his way. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. There's so much in that text to think about and to reflect on. One, I can tell you as a preacher, a pretty novice preacher, right? But I can tell you if you're going to read a piece of scripture and then you're going to close the Bible and say, I got to tell you guys, all of that is talking about me. That's a strong maneuver. (laughs) You do have to be Jesus to pull that off, right? But he's teaching, right? And he's explaining about all that God is going to be doing through him right? All that God is going to be doing through him, all this liberation, all of this good news, all of this healing. It's the first time he said anything like this to these people, right? About what God is going to be up to through him. And they all say, that's amazing. We can't wait for you to serve us and do all these wonderful things for us, right? And then he points out, do you realize that in these other moments, right? In the long history of what God's been up to, people have wanted nothing more but for God to be there for them, to serve them, to do their bidding, to, re- to relieve their ills. But don't you realize over and over again, God's been up to and about this business of spreading God's grace to the outsiders, to the people that we don't think are worthy, to the people that we don't think belong or are good enough. Do you realize over and over again, that's what God has been doing? And he points to some Old Testament prophets with those very same stories and says, I'm going to be doing that very same thing, right? I'm not going to be doing exactly what you expect. All of the fullness of God in me is not simply here to do your bidding, right? To relieve all of your concerns and ills. It's not just here for you. It's for the entire world, particularly for the people that you don't think belong, particularly for the people that you don't think deserve it, particularly for the people that you do not believe have earned it. And how do they respond to this, right? They chase him to the edge of town and toward a cliff and try to kill him. One of the things that we're going to see over and over and over again throughout the stories of Jesus' life, right? Something that you'll learn as you read the Bible, something that you'll learn as you go to Bible studies, as you participate in worship, is that over and over and over again, the people who are looking for God's Messiah right? The people who are looking for the good news of God's presence, the people who are looking for evidence of God's work in the world, look Jesus right in the face and they miss it because they're not looking for the right thing, right? They're looking him right in the face and they miss it. So one of the things that's hard for us to recognize is that God works miracles, And yet the miracles over and over again that God's work is not exactly what we're looking for. Uh, By the way, uh, I taught a Bible study on Wednesday nights that's kind of going on a hiatus now for a while. Uh, But I was teaching in the Gospel of John, and and Jesus was working a whole bunch of miracles in, in the Gospel of John. And so I was describing the miracles that Jesus was working, and then everyone was laughing at me in the class, which is a unique teacher experience to me that I, I get a whole lot. And apparently, when I say miracles, that's not how you pronounce miracles. <laughs> Apparently, there's another way to pronounce miracles. And I'm saying, like, Jesus does miracles. And they would all laugh. And they would say, you're saying it wrong. And then they would and I'll say, how do you say it? And they say, miracles. And I say, I'm saying miracles. Anyway, <laughs> if you're one of the people that is opposed to this pronunciation of miracles, this is going to be a tough week. <laughs> so I just want to say that right now. God's grace and peace to you. I'm doing my best. Um, <laughs> We're looking for miracles. Uh, Miracles. Is that it? That sounds awful. Miracles. It sounds terrible. It's not right. It's miracles. It's nuclear. Just get over yourself. Um, God does miracles, right? Over and over and over again, God does miracles, right? Stop it. (laughs) Y'all need to break y'all up is the problem. (laughs) So God does the M word over and over and over again in lives, right? And yet what we want to see is like a comet coming from the sky. Sometimes that happens, right? What we want to see uh, is someone who has stage four cancer and the doctor says they're never going to live and they do another scan and it's all gone. That does happen sometimes too, right? Over and over and over again, those kind of things happen. What happens even more, right? What happens much, much, much more 
What happens unfathomably more is that God works miracles through ordinary people, right? And when the people of Israel were looking for this Messiah, right, what they were looking for was someone with a perfect lineage. And what they were looking for was someone with a perfect background. And what they were looking for was someone with uh, a perfect pedigree and a perfect military acumen and all of the right things politically to come and give them what they want in the way that they wanted it. And what they were missing was what God was doing through ordinary people and through poor people and through a forgotten community and through a seemingly ordinary man, right? Over and over and over again, what people miss is that God works miracles through ordinary people. If we're making the transition, right, from Christmas being like it's your birthday, where it's simply about presents and where it's simply about parties and where it's simply about family and about good togethers. And all of those things are wonderful, by the way. I hope your life overflows with each and every one of those things, right? I hope your life overflows with parties and with presents and with family and with get together and with all of those things. But if you want to move from Christmas just being about your birthday to being a little bit about what God's doing in Jesus's birthday, then the first step for you is to look for miracles, what looking for miracles uh, looks like for some of you is for praying for them in your own life, right? Just op- openly acknowledging the things that seem to be hopeless and openly acknowledging the things that, be, that seem to be stuck, right? The relationships that seem to be just permanently, permanently broken, right? Or the doors that seem to be irrevocably shut, right? The bridges that seem to be completely and totally burned, Right. For some of you, it's about looking in your life and your own need for a miracle. But one of the things that you need to understand is that if and when that miracle is answered, and it may not be, right? but if and when that prayer for a miracle is answered, it is much more likely that that answer will, seem, will come to you through a seemingly normal person right? than in any other way. Some of you, in making your uh, season a little bit more closely connected to what God is doing in Jesus, need to look for miracles in your own life. But the vast majority of us, myself included, the vast majority of us need to be going through this season praying and going through this season asking and going through this season looking for a way in which we cannot just do charity or we cannot just be kind, but a way in which we can be a miracle for somebody else. So I shared a story of me probably at my lowest um, almost a decade ago when it came to just kind of really understanding what Christmas was about or even really resonating it. You know, my, my kind of engagement in the whole season had pulled away from the materialistic, but there wasn't much left behind it. And so I was just praying, you know, God, I, wanted, I, wanted, I want this to mean to me what it seems to mean to so many other people, right? And I, and I had a good season and I had a good uh, time and um, I was working at another church at the time, uh, not in a clergy position, but in, but in a staff position. And that church, like our church, has you know, everything going on uh, in the course of the Christmas season, right? Culminating with hours and hours and hours of worship on Christmas Eve. And so, of course, I'm there all the time, and it's, and it's incredible worship, but I'm also working, right? Let's call a spade a spade. And uh, so it's really busy and hectic. And so I get home, and this is before um, my son is born. So it's just my wife and I, and we have Christmas, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, wonderful Christmas. And then I can't remember what year it is, but what I remember happening is that bad weather was coming. Uh, bad weather was forecast to arrive in the evening of Christmas leading into uh, the next coming days. And there's a really good possibility that we're going to be like iced in. Because, you know, we don't get snow, we get ice, and then our solution is sand for some reason. Because, like, you know what would make this better? Mud. Uh, anyone who's lived up north has real questions, myself included. Um, but sand is our biggest. So anyway, I'm, I'm anticipating not being able to go to the grocery store. And so my, my wife and I have been so busy leading up to this season, there's, like, no food in the house. And all of a sudden I'm realizing, like, I, I, need, to, I need to go get food. And it's Christmas Day, and we're about, we might be snowed in for three days. I can't remember if it happened or not, but we need to go get food. And so I need to go to the grocery store. And guess what's not open on Christmas Day, right? Grocery stores. And so I'm driving around, and I can't find a grocery store that's open. And I find, like, a little groceria in Haltom City that's open. So I'm like, God provides. And so I go in, and I'm doing all my shopping, and I'm checking out. I don't know what time of day it is, but it's dark. So anytime after 3.30 in the afternoon, I guess. And... I'm checking out in the line, and um, there's a, uh, 
a, a middle-aged woman and, her, and a teenage girl with her, I assume it's her daughter, and they're paying with, uh, and this happens a lot in the part of town that I live in, they're paying with their EBT card, what you might call like food stamps, right? That's what they're paying with. And um, so there's, a, there's a, a problem that's kind of happening with the transaction, right? So it's just taking, I'm, it's kind of snapping me out of my just, you know, my grocery store coma that I'm in um, and realizing there's a problem here. And if you've ever been in a situation where this is happening, there, it's usually kind of a, a quiet conversation between the cashier and the person because they don't want to embarrass them. And uh, I'm, I'm just kind of looking and I'm paying attention and they have just like a mammoth collection of groceries, but it's, and it's obviously like to feed a family for many days, amount of groceries. And, uh, you know, anytime you give them like three loaves of white bread at a time, right, they're, they're trying to feed a whole bunch of people. And I'm, I'm overhearing what's happening and the cashier is so frustrated and upset is because what's happened is the food stamp EBT system is down, right? So it's not like it's just, you know, the, nothing wrong with the card, nothing wrong with their account, right? It's their whole systems is down. And there's, she just can't get it to work. And there's no one to call because it's Christmas. And there's no one to fix it because it's Christmas. And you're just like seeing the face of this woman and this teenage girl. And I'm sure this is already a difficult moment for them buying all these groceries in this way anyway. And they're being told, I'm sorry, there's nothing for you. And there's nothing we can do. And the cashier is frustrated and upset. And they're frustrated and upset. And they're just walking out the door with nothing, all right? And so here I've been, right, praying for weeks. God, let Christmas mean something to me. God, let this, let this season mean something to me. Like, God, let something grow in me. Let Christmas be more about, uh, in my life, what it seems to be like for everybody else. And here I am, and it's the dark, and it's the cold, and it's Christmas. And I see two people. I see a family, right, in desperate need, and the solution is something that I can provide, Right? I've been in a lot of situations in my life where I wasn't in this position to just step up and buy a week's worth of food for a family, but I was in that position today, in that day, right? So I did what every single one of you in the room would have done, right? Bang, done. Merry Christmas. And we just talked, right? We're just, we're just talking, and, and they're so appreciative, and they're so thankful, and they're being, like, super generous. Like, sometimes you don't know how people are going to react in that situation if they want to just kind of, like, move on, and I would have been fine with that, but they wanted to, like, talk and be thankful. And what I had to tell them was, like, I, guys, I mean, I've been praying for weeks to get to, be, to get to have something special happen, for Christmas to mean something for me, right? And, and, and I got this chance, right? And, I, and I've, I've, some of you have been to the gathering before. I've told this story before. Um, the reason I'm telling it is because it, it's, like so, it's not only formative in my understanding of what Christmas is. It, it's formative to my whole life, right? That was the first time ever I spent weeks and weeks praying to get to see a miracle, Right? I spent weeks and weeks and weeks praying for God to use me. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks praying for something to happen. And on the cold, in the dark, in Haltom City, at a grocery store, I got a chance to be part of someone else's miracle. So in your family, right, with your kids or with your extended relatives, do what you do. Right? Have the parties, have the, have the presents. Have the fun, have the get-togethers. And when you're praying, right, when you're praying in Christmas, when you're praying through this season, add to your list, God, I know that you are working miracles around us. God, I know that you are breaking into the world around us. God, I know this is the season where whatever barrier that exists between heaven and earth seems to be exceptionally thin right now. I know there are people that are in desperate need of a miracle, and I have eyes to see. God, I am looking for it. God, I don't know what it looks like. God, I don't know what it takes, but I am here and I am looking. Because if you aren't, you will miss it. If you aren't, you will miss it. But if you are, right? If you are, if you have eyes to see, if you have ears to hear, if you are paying attention, God is working miracles all around us, and God is inviting you to be a part of it. So here's what I ask. In your family, in this season, whatever's coming through, all the busyness and all of the goodness and all the wonderfulness of the season, because it is each and every one of those things, add to it, God, this is Jesus' birthday, and you are inviting us into a new way of everything. I am looking for miracles. I am paying attention, and you just tell me what you see. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, this is not 
a normal time of the year. This is not a normal season. This is not just another place on our calendars, God. This is the Christmas season, the season where you look at a cold world, a dark world, a lonely world, a world caught up in its own greed, its own anger, and its own mistrust, and God, you give us Jesus. In the midst of all of the fear, you give us Jesus. In the midst of all of the believing that it is through strength and power that we become strong, you give us Jesus. God, in the midst of us thinking that there's no more to the world than what we can see, you give us Jesus. God, you are working miracles all around us. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and give us the chance to be a part of it too. God, we come here expecting that you will give us that opportunity. So in all that we do, God, we simply lift up your name and pray together the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite our communion stewards to come forward and assist with the serving communion, I'm also going to do so in room 350 up in the Gathering Cafe. We have some stewards up there. If y'all would please go forward uh, to the altar table as well. We've extended the communion table uh, to that location as well. Um, as we come forward, we do so with a reminder that every time we come to the gathering, every time we come to worship in this place, we always end with the culmination, with the highlight being an encounter to taste, touch, feel, and know the presence of Jesus in our lives, not just in Christmas, but all times, all places. And we do so, do so through the sacrament of Holy Communion, which he instituted on the day that he was to give himself up for us. When he took a piece of bread, gave thanks over it, broke it and passed it and said, take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it and passed it and said, take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do it often in remembrance of the one who promises to be with us now and every day of our lives. When we receive communion by coming forward down the center aisle, both here and in the gathering cafe, you'll come forward with your hands held open like this. A piece of bread will be torn off the loaf, placed in your hand. You'll then take it, dip it into the chalice, eat it, and return down the outside aisle for a time of silent prayer or for singing along with Savannah in the band. We always celebrate communion with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't want anyone to ever have to choose between sobriety and the sacrament. We're also going to have a gluten free station off to the side for anybody with a sensitivity to weed. This is not the gatherings table. This is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's love, like Christ's grace, like Christ's presence with us, it is for all people, all ages, all backgrounds. It is for you today. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward and be fed. to the certainty of life and my need to know everything this illusion cannot speak cannot walk with me at night as I taste life's fragility I abandon my addiction to the certainty of life and my need to know everything. This illusion cannot speak, it cannot walk with me at night as I taste life's fragility. I am looking for a savior I can see and know and touch One who dwells within the midst of us May a broken God be known In the earth beneath our feet 
of getting through the day we begin to know our weakness and denial isn't strong enough to hold our fears at bay and we can't escape our emptiness when our plans become the casualties of getting through the day and we begin to know our weakness and denial isn't strong enough to hold our fears at bay and we can't escape our emptiness we are looking for savior we can see One who dwells within the midst of us. May a broken God be known in the earth beneath our feet. May our souls behold humility. May our souls behold. can see and know and touch one who dwells within the midst of us may your broken God be known in the earth beneath our feet may our souls behold humility may our souls behold humility As we come to the end of our time of worship together, just a few announcements. One, we now have breakfast tacos and things like that for sale in between the services. So it's also going to be for sale before the next service. Thank you so much, folks, worshiping in the Gathering Cafe upstairs. That's going to be open every Sunday during the 930 service to help us continue to make space for newcomers and visitors. As you exit today on the table in the back, there's going to be a clipboard that has sign-up opportunities to volunteer together for Christmas Eve services to usher and to greet. It's an incredible way to show the hospitality of Christ on a day where it's very, very much needed. I think about 7,000 people come to worship on Christmas Eve. Uh, uh, and if not, I'll just keep saying it because it sounds good. Um, it's very many thousands, I can tell you that. And then uh, finally, one of the most important things you can do over the course of the season is to pray and continue to, like we talked about, invite God into your life. And we have an Advent devotional uh, also in the back of the room. We'll be passing out to people um, so that being said, I also want to let you know that Brandon and Deanna are going to be uh, welcoming and Are you going to be in the back or up here? They're going to be in the back. So Brandon and Deanna are uh, two members of our church that are part of the welcome committee. Uh, if you haven't got connected, if you'd please just say hi to them. They've got the ask me on the back. They've also got a gift. If you're a first time visitor here, uh, we have a special gift for you. So please go and connect with them. They'll make sure to give you a gift. Um, I'll be in the back as well. So uh, may God bless you and keep you. I mean, sorry, back your head and receive this benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And when you pray to be a miracle, may God open your eyes to the ways in which you can be a miracle for someone else as well. Amen. Go in peace.